Welcome again, everyone, um, to our first presentation of the 2017 ATJ Tech Fellows uh, Program training sessions. Um, our guest presenter today, um, who will be uh, presenting Design Thinking and Legal Service, is Dan Jackson. Um, Dan directs the new law lab at Northeastern University School of Law, um, a four year old in interdisciplinary laboratory that is merging art and law to further legal empowerment. His current work includes partnering with the Massachusetts Trial Court and the design consultancy IDEO to tackle a fundamental redesign of Massachusetts Housing Court. The project is a five-year effort to use tested service and system design methods to approach the challenge from the perspective of full range of end users of the court. We hope our results, uh, and I'll let Dan take it from there. Sounds good, thank you, Miguel. Hello, everybody, my name is Dan Jackson. First of all, most importantly, congratulations on your selection as the inaugural class of Access to Justice Tech Fellows. Um, it's a pretty exciting program, I gotta say. Um, a couple years ago, I think it was, Miguel, a couple years ago that you hit the, you hit the ground running as a first year um, in your law uh, school program and started immediately networking with a lot of folks out there in the access to justice community and with a particular emphasis on technology. That's when Miguel and I first met, um, at least digitally, uh, virtually met. Um, and I was particularly excited by the fact, by his vision for uh, a student-run initiative that would embed law school students into legal services organizations with the mission of helping them to develop some technology tools that would advance our ultimate goal of uh, justice for all um, one way or another. So I'm particularly excited. I'm, I'm, I'm particularly psyched to be the first one before you guys are sick of webinars. So I'm very happy about that. I would encourage everybody to ask questions either in the chat box that Miguel has already opened up um, or by speaking up if the if the audio is working. Um, I'm usually used to speaking in front of um, human faces <laughs> where I can see whether or not somebody has a question popping up and I can call on them or you know sort of have a little bit more of a dialogue. Um, so uh, do everything you can to get my attention as I uh, run through a lot of content in a very short period of time. But I am thrilled to be part of this new program. I'm hoping that uh, this uh, continues its trajectory um, uh, and uh, becomes a uh, uh, part of the really accelerating uh, pace of using technology to uh, create new ways of connecting people to their legal rights um, and self-activating them. I'm, I'm, my goal here is to give you a primer on how you can use human-centered design methods to unlock what I think is the potential for your fellowship organization. Um, did I, I, I sent around, I um, sent um, some advance reading. Hopefully you all were able to read it in advance. I always feel really embarrassed about sending around <laughs> an article that I wrote, but nevertheless it actually speaks to our very um, topic here today, which is the imperative of using human-centered design when lawyers design technology tools. So before we get into the slides and into the content, I want everybody to just take a moment, close your eyes if you're in a space where there's lots of noise and whatnot, and think about the most frustrating experience you've ever had with technology. And now I want you to think about the most frustrating experience you've had in law school. And I want you to merge them now <laughs> and think about what that would look like if lawyers were let r allowed to run amok in the world of technology and technology solutions uh, for people who are trying to access their legal rights. Um, without regard to how real people actually interact with technology. Um, I actually think that it would be sort of like an IKEA flat pack instruction manual from hell. I've seen it. Um, you know, 15, 25 years ago, a lot of lawyers were designing websites to give a lot of people a lot of information about their legal rights, and it was way, way too much information. More information than any human could possibly digest. So um, I'm here to hopefully give you some tools and some techniques and some opportunities that you will be able to use during the course of your fellowship this summer 
to unlock potential within your organizations for a better way. Um, and this is really, really a 30,000 foot overview. So I want you to keep that in mind and know that at the end of the presentation, I'll be sharing with you all of my contact information so that you can reach out to me over the course of your summer. If you have any questions, if you want to run your plan by me, anything like that, I'm here to help all of you because I think this is an awesome thing. So the new law lab, this is where I'm coming from. Uh, hold on, let me advance the slide. All right, new law lab. We are a four-year-old interdisciplinary. I just want to give a sort of a back background on who I am, where I'm coming from, so you know uh, how strange of an initiative I <laughs> run right over here at Northeastern Law School. Um, we are a four-year-old interdisciplinary innovation laboratory. We are particularly focused on merging creative arts methods with law to come up with radical new ways of giving people the chance to self-activate their legal rights without regard to hiring a lawyer. Now, um, a lot of people look at me like I have three heads when I say that, especially coming from a law school, and it's like, why are you uh, trying to train lawyers when you're trying to give people the opportunity to actually self-activate their legal rights? And the fact, the fact of the matter is that if the lawyers don't get involved right now in the growing movement towards legal empowerment, in particular digital legal empowerment, we will be lapped. It's already happening in uh, continents like Africa and Asia. Um, it's already happening uh, in parts of the United States. And so our lab here at Northeastern University School of Law is an attempt to get lawyers involved in that process as well. Um, some of our work, you know, our, our, our work overall is uh, structured around three basic concepts. The first is collaborative design, where we work directly with the end users to design the product or service itself. The uh, second is a interdisciplinary approach, where we try to merge with as extreme of other disciplines as possible. So we don't go for political science. We go for theater or creative arts. You know, We try to actually bridge a gap that is much larger than the usual interdisciplinary gap. And the third thing is that we're doing it all at the law school because we actually want to give law students the tools to become the legal inventors of the future. Um, some of our project work, which puts a little bit of a finer point on it. On the upper left-hand corner, you'll see a screenshot from Represent, which is the first digital game to teach people how to represent themselves in court. It's right now uh, in Connecticut, um, and we designed that with Connecticut um, Statewide Legal Services of Connecticut. It was funded by Legal Services Corporation Technology Initiative Grant Program. You will hear from Glenn Rodden next, I believe. Um, and he, uh, I love Glenn. He is a master of this. And the, um, you know, LC had the, the foresight to actually give us money three years ago to start this crazy idea of trying to create a digital game to give people uh, um, the education they need to represent themselves in court. On the far right, you also see a stateside legal, which is um, a um, screenshot of a mobile, uh, uh, What's the best word to describe this? We worked with Pine Tree Legal Assistance of Maine to take their stateside legal women who serve program, turn it into something called women with military service, and better connect uh, low-income women of, with military service to their benefits and rights. Um, and all, doing all that, again, through a mobile, a mobile tool and doing all that through uh, code design, which I'll talk about in a little bit. In the middle, you'll see our new law maps program where we um, developed a platform that we would allow us to embed um, uh, multimedia content into geographical waypoints so we could, we, we like to think of this as the warm data and the cold data, where we can merge storytelling, digital storytelling into geographical waypoints and heat maps and the like to tell the stories, the human stories behind lack of access to justice. And on the far left and the bottom, you'll see a screenshot of a, a prototype for our uh, digital civil rights restorative justice project where we're trying to crowdsource uh, restorative justice uh, through our CRJ program here um, in uh, at Northeastern. Uh, the biggest program that we've gotten, Miguel mentioned this, is um, a five-year, $5 million effort to redesign housing court for the age of self-representation. We are partnered with IDEO on doing that. We're working hard to raise the funding to get it actually started. So with that, I'm going to jump into some of uh, what we're going to actually do for you. So our agenda today, I'm going to walk through 
design, design thinking, the difference between the two things. I'm going to talk a little bit about the design process itself. It's a process, I mean, lawyers love process. If you can structure it into four different things that you have to work through, it's actually a pretty easy way to uh, engage with ideas. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about end user engaged design and co-design um, and the difference between the two and what you can expect to accomplish during your few, very few months, very little, limited time uh, in your sponsor organization. Um, I'll then hit prototyping, which is the most difficult thing for lawyers to do. Shocking that we would be uncomfortable with incomplete ideas, but it's true. I'll talk a little bit about how you can actually get around that. I'll then talk about some tools and resources that you can use over the course of these next couple months. And then finally, I'll close out with some insights that I've uh, taken um, from uh, four years of designing with legal organizations. Um, it's not easy because uh, legal organizations, like, they like certainty, they like precision, they do, are not necessarily comfortable with a lot of uh, mushy gushy stuff that is about human centered design and empathy and all that kind of stuff. Um, I'm going to hopefully give you some insights on how you might be able to navigate that. A little bit about my background just so you know who the heck you're listening to. Um, I am, I started my career as a theater designer with a, a degree from Northwestern University in Evanston, Illinois. Worked for a number of years doing that before I came to law school here at Northeastern. Uh, for three years, then did a uh, one-year clerkship at the First Circuit Court of Appeals, which was an amazing experience, um, and then worked for 13 years at the law firm of Bingham McCutcheon before um, I came here to start the new law lab. And Bingham is now part of Morgan Lewis. So let's move on here. Okay, so design as a concept. If you had a chance to read the advanced reading, you'll know there are some abstract concepts which are actually rather helpful to think about. Design in the abstract notion, I'm not talking here about um, aesthetics. Aesthetics are important. Um, they actually, they actually um, impact in a big way the user experience, especially when you're dealing with a digital interface. But design as a noun, if you will, is about object creation. It's manifested by an agent. You all are the agents for this purpose. To accomplish a goal or goals yet to be determined because you're yet to really embed into your organizations, although you may have started some conversations that have started to articulate what those are. And where the object satisfies a set of requirements, the design requirements, it's often, often called, called a design brief, where you actually say, here's what we need to accomplish. Um, and where the creation of the actual object is subject to certain fixed constraints, so you actually have limitations around you that you can't ignore, <laughs> unfortunately, as much as we would like to be able to accomplish so many things in so little time and with so little money, you actually do have constraints. Design constraints are probably the most important part of design. Now, that's a very abstract definition. I actually think Margaret Hagen does a much better job with the definition. She says the practice of making things that are useful, usable, and engaging. If you are not yet following Margaret Hagen on Twitter, you should do so. Um, she is a legal design pioneer here in the United States. She's at Stanford. Um, um, I adore working with her. We had her out here at Northeastern about six months ago for a, a sort of senior design seminar. Um, and she does a fantastic job of really uh, drilling things into very basic concepts that we can all absorb and understand. Um, and uh, she, we, I'm, I'm thrilled that the fact that my lab is one of really only two uh, labs, two or three, three, four, maybe, maybe four, maybe four, so a couple out there sort of still in their infancy that are um, in the process of becoming um, legal design labs. Uh, Margaret is one of them with her uh, Stanford um, Law Lab. And let's talk a little bit about design thinking. First, I want to call out actually our friends from MSU, because I noticed that we have three MSU students. And you all got started with um, reInvent Law back in the day, way back in the day. <laughs> it doesn't may not seem like that to you, but it does to me when I first started here at Northeastern. You all were out there uh, doing a lot of great stuff, and now you have the Legal R and D Lab. So I I, sus I count you guys as uh, one of the one of the handful of legal design labs out there. 
um, in law schools that are trying to make all of this happen. So kudos to NSU. I'm from Michigan myself, born and raised in Detroit. All right, so let's talk about design thinking. So design thinking is a mindset that's derived from those concepts, right? This is a Venn diagram that many of you have probably already seen. Um, we've modified it a little bit to work for the law. Um, design thinking w tries to uh, inculcate all those ideas into a mindset as opposed to a process, a way of just working through problems, working through ideas, um, and doing so in a way that is um, diffuse in terms of the, uh, it's not one, two, three, it's kind of one-ish, two-ish, three-ish, right? So you've got desirability, you have to work directly with people to understand what their human need is. Feasibility, you know, what is the actual technological capability and price point, very important. One of the most amazing things recently is the fact that the price point is coming down um, on so much technology. You can get so much more off the shelf now than you, we were able to do just three or four years ago. Uh, and that's a fantastic thing to see. Um, and then viability, so usually you see viability as the business or economic model, right? Or do we have a viable business? So my pals at IDEO and I have changed this to say viable the law. Because so Dan, one quick thing here. Um, yeah. We had somebody asking what Margaret Hayden's um, handle was for Twitter. I put that yep. into the chat where everybody should be able to see that now. Um, also, if you have any questions, we please type them into the question box or um, raise your hand on the control panel and we can unmute you so that you can ask audio questions. That's not a problem. Thank you for flagging the question. I did not see it. So I'm going to move no that little bar over a little bit. Um, yes, uh, Margaret Hagen is uh, at Margaret Hagen. Uh, Twitter, I'm also more than happy to make a personal introduction for anybody to her. She's got a very busy schedule, as most of us do, but then again, um, she's also really dedicated to this concept. So viability, again, you know, going back to the concept of viability, usually it's a business model. Is the business model going to take off? Is there a foundation for us to say that we can actually make this viable? Um, and the law is where this really fits in. You know, what can we actually do with the solution and the law, right? That's a very important um, concept that needs to be addressed and needs to be examined. You all are actually in a really good place to do that because you're closest to the doctrinal and the professional ethics aspects of this work. Um, so that's so design thinking as a as a mindset. It basically embraces deep understanding, desirability, often referred to as empathy. It relies also on iteration and rapid prototyping, which we will get to shortly. Um, and those are really challenging concepts for lawyers. And we'll get to that in a little bit. Um, but it's a mindset that actually works really well. I mean, I can say after four years of doing this now at Northeastern, and I started out, I was very, I came from a large law firm environment, so I was very um, structured in my thinking, to say the least. And yet I was a designer. I still do it. I still design uh, sets for theater productions in Boston and Provincetown, Massachusetts. And, and so I still have design aesthetic, uh, design concepts, you know, near to me. Um, but my law brain was pretty um, rigid. And it took me a while to sort of open my mind up to where we might be able to go here. Um, and so I'm hoping to give you some insights that you might be able to use. Um, in this summer process for your organization. So I'm going to go on to the next slide. Yeah, all right, so here are the four, four phases of uh, design process. Now, when we move away from design as a noun, but more towards design as a process, as a verb, if you will, there's four stages, inspiration, synthesis, ideation, experimentation, and implementation. So inspiration is about understanding the human experience of the people that you're trying to help. And often that is uh, boiled down to the word empathy. And if anybody else on the call is sick and tired of hearing um, the word empathy, <laughs> when it comes to design, raise your hand, your digital hand if you'd like. Um, inspiration is about, in my opinion, for lawyers, shutting up and showing up. You have to suspend 
the natural inclination and the fact that you've been trained to pursue fact investigations in a very linear way with a deliberate purpose to get to certain facts. With inspiration and empathy, you want to be able to pull back and understand what the human experience is. And the best way to do that is to keep your mouth shut, <laughs> to listen and hear what people are experiencing. And to do it in a way, you can ask a question or two, but the questions should be things like, so what's going on? Not, tell me more about this particular situation. Early inspiration is really important to keep the keep as much open as possible um, um, and uh, to keep it as unstructured as possible and to really open up all of your senses. Um, I often bring students to housing court in Boston for just a morning of listening and I instruct them to sometimes just close their eyes and listen to the pressure in people's voices as they're talking in front of a judge without the assistance of a lawyer. And what they hear in that experience is radically different from what they hear if they were sitting across from somebody conducting a fact-based interview, right? So that's inspiration. And that can take a lot of different, and we'll get, when I get to the end, I'll talk about some additional um, uh, resources for you to uh, draw from to get a deeper understanding of all these ideas. But inspiration for lawyers really re requires you to zip it and just listen and hear. Synthesis. It's the second piece. That's where you start seeing patterns and start putting together the patterns into actionable ideas. This comes really naturally to lawyers. No surprises there. It, we are actually trained and trained relatively well to separate the material from the immaterial, the wheat from the chaff, whatever you want to put it. Um, and so synthesis is actually a pretty straightforward approach for lawyers. That, that will come very naturally too. Idea, ideation, experiment, experimentation. Now ideation is actually, you know, it's coming up with as many ideas as possible. Um, that's not so difficult for lawyers. Experimentation is, and we will get to, I mean, I have a whole, have a whole part on prototyping at the end of this presentation that we will talk about, but it is, don't discount how difficult that is for all of you. Um, experimenting for lawyers, we don't do it, we're not trained to do it, we actually are trained to come out with the best possible result at the earliest possible time. We are not about experimenting, we're not about prototyping, we're not about incomplete ideas. I will hopefully by the end of this convince you that you can actually use some of that uh, to get to a better product in the final analysis. Implementation is the last phase of uh, design and that is really easy for lawyers because that's what we do. That's very, very straightforward. So um, now I want to drill into two ideas that I think um, are things that as you look at your uh, summer ahead of you that you will want to consider using. Um, the first is what I refer to as end user engaged design and the second is co-design. Um, these are both ways of getting at the ultimate empathy that you should have as a legal designer with the people that you are hoping to help. Now, the goal should be this. This is kite surfing. Do we have any kite surfers on, <laughs> on the call? <laughs> you never know. Kite surfing. If you don't know it, it's a pretty amazing sport. In 2001, so 16, 17 years ago, an MIT student named Saul Griffith started a website dedicated to kite surfing. And kite surfing is where people started to take these kites that you would see on the beach that grab the wind in a really impressive way and they sort of merged it, married it with um, surfing and with windsurfing, which is, you know, where you have a, looks like a, almost like a sunfish small sailboat, um, but but you're surfing on it. Um, so, but this guy named Saul Griffith started a website because people were starting to take those uh, surfboards and the kites and merge them into this new sport. Um, site users actually soon started posting patterns for self-designed kites and boards that were working with the unique 
um, angles and stresses and whatnot to make it really work. And the collective design effort actually soon proved more effective than a $100 million commercial industry that was trying to capture this. So the manufacturers around the world started to begin to download and build user designs off of Seth's or Saul's um, uh, website rather than design their own. So Eric von Hippel, who's a sort of end user based design guru from MIT, first sort of articulated this as the ultimate uh, example of end user based design. And that basically is your goal, right, <laughs> if you will. Um, for the work that you're going to be doing this summer is to find something that actually uh, works for the people that you intend to help and does it in a way that is um, really native, you know, something that is organic and it comes naturally and it works for the people, uh, not the lawyers, right? So this is a picture of a uh, session that we had in Connecticut with a bunch of legal aid lawyers and librarians and some game designers and some self-represented litigants uh, for our game represent uh, that is an example of end user based design where we're actually we had some basic ideas that you can see on the table there sketched out some scenarios and we had some markers and we wanted people to get some we want some feedback on the basic uh, structure of what we were proposing um, and that's one way to get at that information, is to sit down early and often with the people that you are hoping to help and also with the people who are already helping that population and start testing. Testing early, testing often, testing as much as you can, whenever you can, right? So co-design is a slightly deeper engagement. You will not be able to get to co-design in two and a half, three months, as much as I wish that you could. Co-design is where you are collaboratively designing a solution with a group of people who are not experts in the work that you're engaged in, um, but you're doing it collectively. And this is a photograph of a session in 2013, which I can't even, it's like, how many years ago was that? So many, it seems. Uh, very early on for my lab um, with uh, law students and Massachusetts based domestic workers brainstorming around a idea that eventually became a hotline for domestic workers in Massachusetts that would educate them about their new legal rights under the Massachusetts Domestic Worker Bill of Rights. And about, it's about half and half in that picture of between domestic workers and, and, um, and law students. And that project, that co-design project, actually evolved over many, many years. So we had three years so far, three and a half years of that project that has evolved and there's a real co-ownership of the idea, there's co-ownership of the solution as well. Um, and that is a, that's taking end user based design to a very extreme end, an ultimate and actually a very valuable and very desirable, I think, and uh, where the community that you're hoping to help is actually a co-owner of the concept. Um, there's a lot out there that is actually very uncertain in that space in terms of uh, actual ownership of ideas, intellectual property ownership, where actually my lab is pursuing a few ideas and a few grants to try to pursue that, come up with some template agreements and the like that might be actually able to uh, facilitate this a little bit further. Uh, you won't be able to get to co-design, co but I want you to keep your eyes and ears and senses open for the possibility because you will come across opportunities for co-design during your summer that I want you to alert your sponsor organizations to. Um, it's hard for legal services organizations to devote the resources ne necessary to actually do a deep dive into that kind of work, but you should actually be have your antennas up for that because you never know where you're gonna be able to find um, with that. All right, prototyping. Lawyers don't prototype. <laughs> We don't. We don't. You are not trained to prototype. You are trained to get it right the first time because we don't do it a second time unless you're in moot court, right? Moot court is one example or uh, other, um, you know, sessions where you might be able to have a chance to do a dry run. That's maybe a prototype. But for the most part, pro lawyers don't prototype. The challenge is pretty significant in that 
you will have ideas over the course of the summer that you think are good ideas. You will want to develop those ideas further so that when you present those ideas, they are manifest as, as, as a complete idea with all of the questions answered as much as possible, basically what you've been trained to do. I want you to resist that. And I want you to think about instead sharing your ideas as early as soon as possible so that the people that you're hoping to help or the client you're hoping to serve can have an opportunity to actually reflect and respond and give you some insight and give, some, give you some information that you might be able to then incorporate down the road. It's, you know, for anybody who's on the call who's actually done some design work as a lawyer, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Every time I run into other folks doing this work in legal education, I ask, what's the biggest challenge? And everybody always says, prototyping, prototyping, oh my God, it's so difficult because people can't wrap their head around it. It's very difficult for lawyers to do, and I just want you to just sort of mer you know, push through that. What we do at our lab here in Boston, we have a seminar we run every quarter, so we have a quarterly system. So four times a year I teach a lab seminar um, that teaches law students how to work with human-centered design techniques uh, in legal problem solving. And we always tackle the design question. So for example, this summer's design question, I'm looking up at my whiteboard right now, uh, is how might a board game facilitate constructive dialogue across political difference? We're going to dig into that question using human-centered design techniques. And this is a photograph of an early lab seminar that we had um, where we prototyped ideas using construction paper and the like, right? And that is um, a very uncomfortable space for lawyers. I can't overstate it. I'm probably beating, a, beating, it, to the, <laughs> beating it to the ground here. I, I just urge all of you to work through that and to um, think about ways that you might be able to test your ideas early and often with as many people as possible so that the ultimate solution is actually one that works for everyone. So understanding the concept of prototyping, right? Here's um, a little bit of a little bit of text to interrupt all these photographs. Um, Prototyping can actually be a best effort because you're actually creating an opportunity for people to have an input into the process of creation. Um, and if you plan it appropriately, it can merge, it can bring you great results. Um, it is difficult sometimes to present ideas to a group that you are hoping will embrace them and you will be received with rejection. And it hurts, it just hurts. It's a human pain. Um, you have to find a way to listen to the rejection and understand it as a response to your idea that gives you an opportunity to build on it and create more as a concept. Um, run your, all of your ideas as you get them past users as soon as possible. Um, it, can, uh, it can be your friends at first. Do a dry run with law school classmates on the phone. Send them a, a sketch, literally a sketch, um, and say, what do you think? What do you think? If you were this person, what would you do? So try it, do a dry run with friends at first. It will be hard. It will definitely be hard, but you need to own that because that's the process of being a designer, a legal designer as well. That's where I always often refer to the shut up and show up concept, which is, you know, listen and hear as opposed to direct the interview. Um, and never, ever underestimate the value of paper. <laughs> so prototyping, uh, when I first started this job four years ago, I thought, oh my God, digital prototypes, we have to have this, you know, we gotta have some digital tools for people to work with. No, you can do it on paper, right? Your client is not going to expect you to come in the door with technology right away. But you are going to need to find a way to get feedback on your ideas before you have the technology. And I have some ideas at the end of this for technology you can use, and some of you are probably already using it. Um, but you can use paper. Um, a basic iPhone or Android phone template printed out on paper 
and markers and tape and construction paper. It's amazing what you can actually accomplish with that. And don't forget to use that uh, at every possible turn. Um, sketch, 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 sketch as early as possible, um, as quickly as possible. Um, there is a great digital tool called Proto.io. It's P-R-O-T-O dot I-O. Um, and it's a great uh, interactive tool that allows you to mock up a mobile um, uh, technology solution and just and it's operational. It's not it's not actually uh, it doesn't have the content, but it gives you the basic screens and you can run through it all. It's a really wonderful tool. Um, additional tools. So I'm segging into the additional tools and resources as we turn the corner towards the end of my presentation. Um, two books on the left. Creative Confidence. Uh, it's a fantastic book by Tom and David Kelly. These are the guys who uh, founded IDEO and the D School at uh, Stanford, where Margaret Hagan works and came from, um, called Creative Confidence. It's a great book that really walks you through um, the basics of using human-centered design techniques and methods in a way that will allow you to do tackle just about any problem or question. It's very, very easy to get through. It's got a wonderful appendix with a lot of uh, exercises and tools and ideas. And it's, it's actually the book that we use in my lab seminar as our textbook. So it's a, it's a really great uh, resource. And I would encourage each of you to jump on Amazon and buy, buy a copy of that if you are interested in using these techniques in your um, summer uh, internship. And then Innovating Justice from Hill. So this is the Hague Institute for the Internationalization of Law. They've been around for a while. Um, Innovating Justice of, is a fantastic book that uh, demonstrates the application of this in the context of more human rights, international human rights focused work. Um, but they're a, an amazing organization. It's actually a wonderfully designed book that really walks you through their process uh, in a really sort of granular way. So if you want an example of application of these ideas in the real world in some pretty hardcore <laughs> issues, uh, I will say, um, this is a good book for you. You can go on their website. Again, I can provide all the information on that um, and links to this. Um, and it's a great book. It's I think it's 20, came out 2012, 2013, so it might be a little bit dated, just a little bit. This is an organization that actually ended up, we were a finalist, my lab was a finalist um, for uh, an innovative idea award in 2014 for represent the game before we had a single line of code written um, we were one of three um, uh, finalists including uh, we were joined by John Mayer and Callie you'll hear from John uh, as part of this uh, training program um, and Callie an HJ author uh, he was a successful innovation finalist um, and that was a great event to fly over to the Hague and meet with all of our fellow wizards. On the right, um, the little book of legal of design research ethics um, is a fantastic uh, resource if you want to do a pretty deep dive into working directly with um, vulnerable, pop vulnerable populations. Um, and I would encourage each of you, it's a free, available on their website, ideo.com. Ideo um, and it's a great book if you want to really do a deep dive into this kind of work with directly with people who are, you are hoping to to assist. So let's see what's next. So the last thing I want to cover, it's just some insights on what I've learned over four years of working in this space. Um, when I first started doing this work, I would go out to a lot of law-centered organizations in the region here in Boston. Um, talking about the work we were doing and saying that we were, you know, a lab trying to merge creative arts and law and come up with some radical new ideas. And everybody looked at me like this, literally, be like, law lab? What are you talking about? <laughs> you have no idea what you're doing. Um, but we actually did, and we did because we 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 studied up, we read up, and we actually had, were practiced at what we were doing. Um, what I want to share with you in this final little bit is a little bit about. Um, my advice on working with legal services organizations in this area using human-centered design. Um, the first thing I would say is understand the ethical rules 
that govern lawyers, obviously. I'm sure all of you are facile with that, um, being much closer to uh, professional responsibility necessarily than I am, at least the textbook examples. They are slightly different from legal design ethics. And that's where I think IDEO's little book on um, research ethics is really valuable, and I would encourage each of you to read it. It's really, really short. It's, uh, it's a 30-minute it's a read max. Um, be prepared to disclose your role with any organization that you are working with, and being clear that you are there in the design function and not functioning as a lawyer. Whenever you work with populations of people who need legal help, which are the folks that we're hoping to assist here, um, people are going to want legal help. You're a law student. They are going to assume that you will be able to help them. Be abundantly clear with the limitations of your role. Just articulate it. At first, I will tell you, I started with a bunch of written disclaimers on paper that people signed. and because I came from a big law firm and I thought that's what I should probably do, and it was not very successful. So if you can record, video record or audio record your session, I would encourage you to do so. Start early and just get everybody's agreement that you are functioning in the role of a designer and not that of a lawyer. And that's the approach that we've taken since then. Since the uh, signed disclosure agreements tended to shut down all conversation. Um, second thing I want to share is um, I think right now we are with legal tech in a space where we have to be really careful about the bright shiny object problem in that a lot of funding comes in to deliver um, the next really promising tech tool. And there's lots of promise for technology and digital technology um, out there right now. Um, a digital tool is not necessarily going to solve all the problems. So when we started working with Pine Tree Legal Assistance of Maine uh, three years ago, our first goal was to develop a mobile tool, outreach tool, that would better connect um, low-income women with military service to benefits and rights because only 10% of women with military service actually register for benefits th these days. And they can come in rather handy uh, for folks of limited means. And uh, we did that process. And over the course of that process, we started to pick up on some interesting things. And our next grant from LLC TIG was to then develop a triage tool for non-legal case workers to do the same thing, to connect these women to their benefits and rights. And so we started that process and we picked on some more of these interesting things. And the interesting things basically boiled down to the fact that women with military sexual trauma are not going to turn to a digital tool for help. They are going to turn to another woman who has been in the military and has experienced sexual trauma. So we are now pivoting a bit away from the digital tools to start embedding legal information, access to legal services into existing peer-to-peer -peer mentoring net networks already existing around the country for women with military service, uh, low-income women with military service. Don't be afraid of the non-digital solution. In fact, your technology tool that you ultimately develop with your client, if you will, um, is going to be best served if it is enhanced and supplemented by a network, a something, a human something on the other end of the technology tool that serves as a foundation for person-to-person -person contact. So don't be afraid of that. Don't be afraid to, to identify that, to clarify that, but be aware that most legal services organizations, and this will not surprise any of you, um, don't have a lot of money for additional staffing, additional uh, foundational support for additional people coming in uh, to the system or to the organization for help. It's one of the reasons why we think digital technology is really a, a fantastic addition to the, um, 
to the puzzle, a great addition to the solution, is because we actually have a chance to scale out ideas and um, and resources and help in a way that does not necessarily rely on one more person sitting behind a computer terminal. But don't be afraid of voicing the fact when you need that. Um, your organizations that you're working with will need to know in a very clear-eyed way uh, what individual personal people resources they're going to need to bring this idea to its full um, potential. Um, so don't be afraid of those analog solutions. Um, maybe sacrilege for me to say that in a technology <laughs> uh, fellowship, but it's an important thing that you need to keep in mind as you go forward because a lot of those organizations are going to be needing that. Um, the last thing I'm going to say is here's my contact information. My name is Dan Jackson. I'm the executive director of the New Law Lab. It's my email. It's my phone number. Um, I believe in this program. I believe in all of you. I'm excited about all of your uh, partnerships that you've got going on. If you have questions about this approach, about human-centered design, if you have um, ideas you want to run by me, if you have a co-design plan or a, uh, any prototyping plan that you want to run by me, by all means, drop me a line. Give me some advance warning. I'll need about three to four days, business days, to turn something around for you, um, just given the fact that my schedule is rather crammed pack. Um, but I think this is an amazing opportunity for all of us. Um, I'm thrilled that this came um, really uh, developed grassroots from law students. Um, and I'm available to help you in whatever way I can. And with that, I'll open up to questions. Uh, so one quick comment here. Um, the little uh, design book um, is free and available to download online. Um, I dropped a link to that download um, in the chat, and I highly recommend it. It's a great book. It's fantastic and entertaining too. Oh, and the last, I will actually add one thing on that. The entertaining that this this can be fun. There's not enough emphasis on fun in the law, and I don't, that may I don't. I'm not trying to sound flip. Um, but there is a value among humans to fun, and I would encourage each of you to try to capture the fun in what you're doing. Yeah, if anybody wants to ask audio questions, just hit the raise hand button and we can unmute you, definitely. Um, <clears throat> first, I, I just want to say thank you, uh, Dan. Um, really appreciate you uh, taking the time. I, I think I will ask the first question, and that question is, why why don't they teach legal design in our uh, law school curriculum? American Bar Association. That's I think fun. that the accreditation standards are a huge problem for innovation in legal education. We are our law schools right now are still in the midst of a significant decrease in admissions and applications. And our admission, our uh, accreditation standards have us really tight um, in terms of what we can do. Um, in there's no there's no free cash rolling around. My la I raise all of the money for this initiative through grants and donations. Right? We don't have free cash rolling around for this. Um, and the law schools that do are already packed full in their curriculum uh, because of accreditation standards. So I actually think the ABA is a problem in that regard, um, and you can tell them I said so. Thank you. <laughs> now I, I completely agree with Dan there. The the way that law school and credits are set up, they don't emphasize these wonderfully practical classes that are interdisciplinary. And they're also at the, um, I think at the, I mean, at bottom, the reason why we're at a law school here is because we believe that our students need to be the legal inventors of the future, not just legal service providers, but inventors, right? And our law school <laughs> accreditation program doesn't see that as a possibility because it, it's because it was built from a different era and a different time. That doesn't mean that each of you aren't able to do it, though and to do it in a really creative way. Use your independent studies as much as possible. We, If you want to come co-op at my lab, come and 
do an internship at my lab for your next summer if you want. And there's Stanford. Margaret is has a, a, a fellowship program of her own at um, Stanford's um, Legal Design Lab, um, Michigan State's uh, R&D Lab. Uh, there's lots of opportunities to do this work if you can, you know, sniff them, sniff them out. Yeah, fellowships, internships, um, anything where you can get that practical hands-on with an organization that is going to give you the freedom to do work like this is much more valuable than any erudite class. Any other questions or comments or rotten tomatoes to throw? So could, could you talk a little bit about um, how you can go after uh, funding or support for projects like this? Because it's just so untraditional of what um, law firms and especially legal services are used to. So I think I do think that, that that's actually a really challenging topic. Um, and it takes a really long time to do that. You have to build these relationships with funders. If you're talking about foundation funding, um, I've spent years building relationships with foundations that I'm only now getting to actually be funded by. Um, and that's a four-year process. Um, and that's a really challenging thing. Um, individual donors are, the thing that what slays me the most <laughs> is when I make a pitch to a donor or you know, foundation or individual otherwise. Um, and the response I get back is, I'm not going to fund this because this has never been done before. And I always look at them and I said, if not you, who? Um, but it's still a problem because people see the law legitimately so and appropriately so as a very conservative um, profession, a very conservative field. Again, appropriately so. Slow change, stability. We like these things on many, many levels. Um, and people have a hard time wrapping their heads around how you can do rapid prototyping in law. It can be done, but we just need the resources to do it and the time to do it. Um, we've had the benefit of doing that, I think, here, only because we've been supported here by the, the law school and by a, a generous alumna donor who got us started a couple years ago, an additional grant um, making primarily from the Legal Services Corporation Technology Initiative grant program. Um, who have seen that they, they are, and when you hear from Glenn next, you'll um, hear plenty of support for the use of design processes um, in this work. Um, I remain of the, I, and I always say to funders who cast a skeptical view towards this, you know, say, oh, lawyers aren't creative, creativity in law, oh my God. And I always say, you know, no. The law as a concept is the single most creative concept that humankind has ever come up with. And we are simply falling behind the curve when it comes to leveraging our creative abilities and our creative talents. We have to stay actually out ahead of it um, as opposed to behind it. We've fallen behind, but you are all you are making it, make make it forward. forward. So we've got two questions here, the first of which I'm going to read out, it's from Andy here. Um, with the combination of lack of funding for programs and lack of innovation in the legal field, do you think that innovation has to start with law schools? No. No, Andy, you're at MSU, right? Um, no, I don't think that innovation has to start at law schools. And I think that we're actually playing a bit of catch up. I think that the, it's already happening. I mean. If you look at the work that is being funded in Africa and India around community paralegal programs that are using GIS mapping to resolve um, property disputes among uh, community members, using community paralegals who are not lawyers but are people who are trained in the issues and the disputes and, and, and the GIS, if the lawyers don't step up soon, we are going to be lapped. I believe that fully. I don't think I have to start with law schools. I mean, our effort is an effort to catch up. Right there, a lot of law schools have a lot of reservations about this. I think that funding strapped nonprofits, if they're able to get a grant to try this stuff, are very, very willing to. 
but it's a matter of making it financially feasible for them. Yeah. Okay, and then I'm going to be um, unmuting somebody here. Oh, hi. Good afternoon. Um, so I guess my question is just related to uh, whether or not you think it's actually better to try to work with tech companies um, in terms of like cultivating this type of space and reaching out to them for support, whether it be funding or just like the structural um, needs around coding and design um, to help with, you know, putting or I guess like moving these ideas forward. So that's a good question. It's an excellent question, actually. The um. Uh, so my experience, keep in mind my experience working with tech companies is at the very sort of high level trying to get funding for major programs, right? So I'm asking them to contribute $500,000 or whatnot. <laughs> and, um, but I think that there's a little bit of a trickle down here. Uh, for-profit companies are going to want to know what the for-profit part is. They need to have a business reason to collaborate with you. So keep in mind when you go out to for-profit companies to do this work that you will need to deliver to them a profit motive to get it to get them in there, right? That is not to say that there are not tech quote unquote companies out there, benefit corporations, nonprofit organizations, uh, Code for America, uh, organizations that are committed to using technology to advance social justice are a major source of, re of additional resources for all of y'all to make this happen. Um, there is no shortage in whatever, wherever you're going to be doing your uh, summer internship, there is no shortage of undergraduate and graduate coders ready to partner with lawyers. I have been consistently thrilled by the fact that when I knock on people's doors here at Northeastern University, we're a large research university in Boston, right? And I say who I am and where I'm from. And they're like, I am so happy the law school has finally come calling because we've been waiting for you, <laughs> right? They are hungry for opportunities to collab. These are, the, these are the social justice coders I'm talking about. They are hungry for opportunities to collaborate with lawyers. Law brings the teeth to it. We have the benefit of the law on our side, and that actually can move entire societies in ways that other disciplines can't. Um, and so you actually have more of a value that you bring every time you knock on someone's door, digitally or otherwise, than you might think. So. Practically, if students, uh, if the fellows here want to get an experience in doing this type of um, rapid design, what, what do you think about um, attending a hackathon or other event like that? Do you think that's valuable in this process? Or uh... I, I think there's no downside in attending a hackathon if you're attending it for an educational experience. I think that you have to be very careful about devoting hackathons often um, tend to, and appropriately so, generate opportunities for people to continue to remain connected and volunteer their time towards a greater purpose. And I think you need to keep your focus very clearly and very focused on the work that you're going to be doing with your sponsor organization this summer um, and focused on that. If the hackathon is supplemental to that and will actually help drive that forward, by all means do it. If the hackathon does not attend, but do it as an observer, as a educational experience, but do not devote your time to moving that idea forward. Um, I, our lab is a little bit of a uh, skeptic on the hackathon movement only because uh, we are very, very invested in long-term co-design because we've learned so much more from that um, than from the short-term stuff. And so I think hackathons have to be scaled appropriately and you have to select them very carefully. I think they can create really fantastic incentive and um, uh, movement forward, and a lot of incredible tools have come out of hackathons, but I think those are unicorns, and I think we have to be careful about putting too much of our time into those. 
which I think you hit on a really interesting one there. Um, how do you really foster the sustainability for projects like this? The fellows are going to be doing awesome stuff this summer. Um, what do they need to do to try to turn that into a long-term institutionally supported project? Understand your client. Spend the time on the front end of your time with your group, the organization you're working with, to really understand what makes them tick, what they really need, what resources they have. You are, you'll be law school interns, so you won't have necessarily access to the executive director's files. <laughs> you may, who knows, if you play your cards right. Um, spend time talking to the people that know really what the organization can do. Um, and that, and 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 here's where you again really need to just prick up your senses. Listen, hear, spend time in the hallways, um, spend time listening to the conversations of the coworkers. Um, what are the what what resources does the organization actually have to devote towards this, and what do they not? The last thing I would want any of you to do is to spend your entire summer focused on the most fabulous technology tool ever that is brilliant beyond compare and that cannot be supported by the organization. That's where design constraints come in. So early on in the slides I talked about you know the concepts of the design as an abstract concept. Design constraints are incredibly important. Understand the human power in that organization that can support the ultimate tech tool. If you understand that as a constraint, you will be able to develop a tool that the organization can sustain into the future and develop further. And that will be a major win for everybody. Well, perfect. Anything else for me? Uh, I, don't, I, I guess we'll call it. Uh, I, I would just want to thank you again, Dan. Uh, I know the fellows are thrilled uh, uh, to have listened to you, and uh, thank you again for taking the time to volunteer, and I know they will be connected over the summer. Please uh, do, because, again, I'm psyched that I got to go first. I'm still really psyched about that. <laughs> but seriously, yeah, find me. You know where I mean. My contact information will be on the slides. Uh, Destiny has all those. You can uh, pop them up online. And uh, Brian did a great job of supplementing with uh, links to uh, the IDEO stuff and some other resources. And um, I'm, I remain available throughout the summer to help all of you achieve your dreams here. Because at the final, in the final analysis, it's about your creative vision. It's the reason why you applied to this. It's the reason why we're all supporting you. Yeah, thank you so much, Dan. We greatly appreciate it. This is going to be a wonderful training for people long term.